Hello, everybody, and welcome to the interview segment for this week's episode of the Jack Brofall Show. And we are joined by a very, very special guest, Matt Amos. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's uh, really good to be on and uh, chatting all things uh, motorsports. So really excited. Absolutely. And we always start with the same question. So could you explain a little bit about what your role in motorsport is and how you fit into the industry of racing? Yeah, of course. So uh, it's kind of two answers to that one. So the first half, which might, people might know me for, is my YouTube videos. So uh, my YouTube channel is all about uh, making videos about how Formula One works and operates. So rather than, you know, capturing uh, my opinions on the season and how it's all going, I look into more of the interesting companies and all the infrastructure into how the sport is actually working. So going from like how uh, Formula One on trophies are created and seeing the process that way all the way up to you know how formula one helmets are made um and like looking into like uh, a deeper look into how yeah effectively how the sport is created and then uh, the other half of my uh, my real world job is uh working as a senior producer at a company called veloce esports uh, where we've got a couple involvements uh, in you know extreme means a lot of esporting uh, routes there uh, and my job there is to create uh youtube contents uh, to try and find the balance between motorsport and entertainment and uh there you go. That's my uh, that's my TLDR, basically. <laughs> that's awesome. And do you remember what your entrance to the industry was like? When did you come up with, you know, the idea that working in motorsport could be a path for you? And, and really, you know, the aim was to get involved in the right in the middle of the industry. Well, I think with this, it's like my entry into it. I think it was kind of the same for a lot of people. It did kind of happen by accident. So um, my expertise uh, before were creating uh, sort of YouTube videos and um, I got into an agency uh, called Lil Dot Studios uh, when I was around about 18 or 19 years old and uh, the main core of the business there is they're responsible uh, for creating uh, official YouTube channels for like TV shows for example Graham Norton, Gordon Ramsay, uh, to like the in-betweeners or the last leg and my job was to basically cut out the best bits from the show, create compilations and um, packages in that way. Um, and then that's what we would sort of provide for different TV shows and channels. Um, and then during that time, um, Formula E had just started. It just, it was at the end of its first season, saw the work that we were doing for these TV shows and wanted to have a, a bigger online presence because, you know, Formula E at the time was very new as a fully electric championship, um, but they wanted just to really up their digital presence so they came to us um we kind of like pitched them what we could do and offer and then uh it kind of just fell into that and effectively my boss came in um and sort of said who's got an interest in motorsport i raised my hand and then i just got assigned it and then from then on it's just grown and grown and grown um and that's how i probably got my start into motorsport it was sort of covering um doing the highlights for the races you know making bespoke online youtube videos so we go out to the races and try and do like a bit more in-depth stuff with the drivers and the teams um and then so i did that for about three four years and then i kind of bit got picked up by uh one of the actual teams themselves who wanted to use my services and um, the way we worked it out is I actually then moved uh, positions to a company called Aurora Media, um, who at the time were doing, or who still actually do the main broadcast uh, for Formula E, so all the TV that I broadcast you see. And then they, they kind of like licensed me out uh, for uh, Envision Virgin Racing uh, to be like their main videographer for the team. So that way the team can use like race footage, um, but then Aurora still get to use me for other projects that they're, they're working on. But that's kind of how I got into motorsport is kind of, like I said, by accident um but that's because i was kind of sort of specializing in like creating youtube content yeah so your journey very much started behind the camera then how do you feel yeah, that absolutely. kind of that, that technical knowledge is applied then in, in your own videos when did you make that jump to being in front of the camera and, and how do you kind of balance those two fields i think it's you do so much work um that you don't really tend to look back on previous work you do um so when you're working in TV, especially if you're working in like, say, the, uh, like a news department, like something that you every week there's new news stories coming out, but you wouldn't ever look back on a news thing you've done like three weeks prior. You're constantly making stuff, constantly editing and constantly churning content out. And it's going through that uh, regimen of uh, constantly working. And, and through that is when I was making so many like VTs and so many uh, sort of news bits um, whilst at Formula E that you can quickly pick up when you're editing the mistakes you did whilst filming. So whether that's, you know, your host has um, is tripping up on a, on a 
bit of script or a bit of lighting was incorrect. And when you're in the edit, you're constantly just like critiquing everything you're seeing. <laughs> Basically, you're like, oh, it's too overexposed or, oh, no, the, the, the performance wasn't that good. And you start to pick up quite quickly uh, what's right and what's wrong, even to the point where when you're doing voiceover, um, when you haven't got um, like a, a proper presenter in at the time, you as the editor will need to lay down some voiceover uh, as like a temp track. But even then when you do it, you know sort of the words and the mannerisms you need to emphasize on to. Um, and it's kind of when, like I've always had an interest in doing YouTube and like, as I said, like my, my sort of career kind of started as that, as a job of creating YouTube content. Um, but then by working in broadcast, it's you pick up on the certain things to convey what you're trying to get across like a bit more or with more enthusiasm um, and it's just through practice and then I kind of wanted to make more YouTube videos which I hadn't really seen online and um, like a lot of the videos I created is it's videos which I wanted to search for and wanted to watch but no one was making them I was really surprised about um, and that's why I kind of like fell into my little my little niche and um, yeah I was kind of happy just sort of just to make videos and that's why a lot of, a lot of my videos you don't see a lot of my face uh, you see me doing an intro and an outro but a lot of the time it's me just focusing on what the subject matter is about I mean that's what the viewer is there for and that's what I'm trying to learn as well um, rather than it just being like all about me um, so I think yeah a lot of the practices I learned when doing most sports stuff properly before is what I can easily then convey and or, or apply to my work I'm doing at the moment and what do you think like the key differences are between a YouTube audience and a traditional broadcast audience? Because it seems like very much, you know, attention spans are quite contracted online. People like kind of quick punchlines, answers in a, in a YouTube video and keeping that even second to second engagement on YouTube is like really important. Even when I look at my own channel, like the growth of the videos, you can see, you know, the retention stats is super important, right, to YouTube for how it promotes your videos. So is that kind of the main difference when comparing the two audiences? Absolutely. I think because YouTube has so many great analytical tools that you can really go into the, de in, into the data and, and see what's working and what's not working. Because a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people rely off opinion with TV of like what they think is good for the viewer. Whereas with YouTube, you can literally look at the data and be like, All right, well, loads of people have dropped off here in the graph. So something there in the scripting or my performance, whatever it is, is knocking people off to not watch it. And YouTube and uh, online is I feel it's very different because we're more easier to like sort of when you're sitting in front of TV, like you can get up during an advert to watch or to go get like a cup of tea or something. But a lot of times we'll just sit there and just power on through because we're there for the for the long haul. Whereas when you're watching something on YouTube, you're wanting something quite quick and snappy. For example, if you were had a broken dishwasher, you don't want to go onto a YouTube video and hear like the guy's life story about why he's brought a dishwasher. It's a little bit like when we are searching like for a recipe and all you're wanting is just the ingredients and how to do it. You're not really there for like the person's backstory or anything. And that's the kind of difference with TV and YouTube. TV is being a bit more breathable space, a lot more like freedom to just let something flow. Whereas on YouTube, you've got to kind of like specify into what you're kind of doing um, because yeah, you need to keep the audience's attention uh, there however you kind of got to find that balance of being authentic if that, that makes sense so I think yeah YouTube is way more data driven to keep the person constantly watching and listening yeah and when you approach making a new video would you say your process is quite structured and defined and proficient I know even you were explaining to me before we started recording your your setup for online calls and stuff it was really important to just have it be efficient and, and fast and just get everything kind of working constantly is it quite, is that how you approach a lot of things in, in video production? Yeah, totally. I think my um, my way, my way of looking at it, and I think it's just through my background of working in TV, is to make it as efficient as possible. So if like, if I want to make a YouTube video, before I used to be like, oh, well, now I've got to get my tripod out, then I've got to put the camera on, then I've got to set it to lights, and I've got to press record, check to see if, the, if it's working all right, um, is the colour correct, and is the shot okay? And it's through all this like extra production stuff I, that if that was just off my plate, then I could have way more fun making videos. Um, so that's why I try to streamline everything. So yeah, like the setup I've got here is my all is always what I'm filming with at home. It's uh, it's a tripod, it's a camera, it's two lights, it's a microphone, um, and a monitor, so I can grade everything. So then, if I'm ever wanting to make a video, or for some, or for example, do something like this, all I need to do is actually sit down, turn it on, and then it's ready to go straight away. It's all about trying to optimize it. Um, and so yeah, my approach with making videos is a bit like that it's like how can I streamline it and I do now have like a proper structure to how I do stuff where 
I think the main um, I think the main confusion people have when making YouTube videos is that any content you're making for the platform, you're not making a good video, you're making a good YouTube video because we've all had it where like even I've had it where I've made like a short film, I put it onto YouTube and then, oh, I'm thinking it's going to get 10 or 20,000 views and it doesn't do that much at all. But that's because YouTube's not optimized for finding stuff like that. It's, it was all about searchability and the way, main way you've got to look at it of making a good YouTube video is you need to start with the thumbnail and the title before you even make the video. Like what's the most clickable way to get someone to watch your content? And then it helps you then make the video. So um, if you've got a good like clickable title, let's say like uh, an extreme uh, simulator on a roller coaster, for example, like that's where you can then walk back from and then you can, when you're filming, you're always knowing what the title is in mind. So you're not having to overfilm anything. And even in the edit, you know what you're always leading towards. Um, but if you've just gone in and filmed something and then try to package it later on and then try and figure out what the title and thumbnail is afterwards, you've done the process wrong because it should never be the second thought. It's the first thing you see on the platform. So that should be the first thing you what think of like, okay, if I'm going to make this video, that's how I'm going to do it. It's the same with Mr. Beast or whomever the biggest uh, creators you see online, although they're different uh, categories of what they are creating, it's what you should always start with. Um, and that's really changed for me as well in like, the last year of like restructuring my videos of like, right, what is the most clickable and sort of um, the, the best thumbnail for this piece? And then it really helps me when I'm making the video because I'm always going back to that strand. If it's not relevant to it, then kick it out. Um, so then you're not just waffling for the sake of it. And when did you first start to see evidence of success on YouTube? Do you remember what your first kind of moment where you're like, oh, wow, this video is really elevating the channel to a, to a new level. I know for, for a lot of people, it would be the videos about the graphics, right? Analyzing yeah. the broadcast presentation in a different way and, and looking at kind of retro footage, bringing it up to the modern day, that sort of thing. Uh, what was it for you when you first noticed that success? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's a bit of a hard one. I think, yeah, I think the graphic videos is the one which kind of like set me apart a bit because not many people back then were making like graphic videos um and again that was literally just um where it was i was just watching some old f1 races i think from back from like the 1970s and literally the thought came into my head of like what would a grand prix look like if it had like the modern day like um like graphics package onto it um because i feel like there's not although like you've got the old heritage of people who watch Formula One who used to love the races from the 70s and 80s, but obviously you've got this new generation who have never even seen that. They may have seen like, you know, a compilation video on YouTube or what have you, but like if they were to have this retelling in a modern day uh, broadcast scheme, like what would that look like? Would it be have the same excitement? Would it have the same, you know, like um, sort of pleasure to sort of carry you, holding you watching the whole, uh, whole like one or two hour sort of race? Um, and then, yeah, like my, I, I, I've had like some sort of experience, you know, doing After Effects stuff. And it did take a while to, you know, to basically recreate it all from scratch um, to sort of sort of key framing of like how the certain animation is going to go, which took the most part. Um, and then once the first video was out, which was like, yeah, how uh, what would classic races look like with modern graphics? Um, that's the one where it properly just sort of launched kind of like sort of overnight, um, where that's where a sudden like F1 audience base sort of came across and it was awesome and I, and I made uh, two more uh, of those ones and then um the last one i i did and the last one i'll, I'll, I'll ever do because it takes way too long to make them um uh was yeah the 1950s uh, grand prix race um which to, the, to this day is probably the most is most proudest i've ever worked on a video just because it's one that took so long um but also because in the previous iterations i did um, I'd always leave like a little Easter egg of purposely putting a bit of wrong information in. Um, so I think there was one where, um, um, I think it was like a replay camera I did and underneath it, it's, I think it said like Bahrain I put when it was in Belgium and I put it in there just a little Easter egg to see if anyone cl um, clock it. Um, but on this one, it was like where all of the fact checking being, uh, had been done correctly, um, to the point where I've got, um, somewhere in my house, it's, um, the first edition program of the lap charts of everything um and like so much work went into that and then the cherry on top was when um, um I, I approached alex jakes to uh, do uh voice over for it um like completely like bespoke and because he had seen the previous iterations of like the graphics videos that massively helped 
respect him being like, oh yeah, he, he he's really happy to do it. Um, and that there for me, I was like, okay, this is cool. Like an actual proper commentator has actually seen the work and he's actually enthusiastic to do it and did it completely for free as well. Um, so I think that was probably the, the proper turning point for it all. And how do you approach the idea of collaboration in YouTube videos? Because your own channel is, you know, you're doing filming, you're in front of the camera, setting it up and, and doing all the editing. But also we've seen the F1 YouTube community and F1 is the kind of online group of fans. It's so interactive where you have, you know, even people with small followings will have audiences and then they'll interact. Like you said, with, with someone with a bigger following like Alex Jakes and it all kind of filters through and the interaction is, is so brilliant at the moment. What's your experience been like collaborating with other creators and uh, Veloce as well is a really important part of that business. Yeah, absolutely. I think the main uh, misconception with YouTube as a whole is that everyone is against each other. So whether that be, you know, two cooks who have got different like cooking, cooking shows or uh, two different like F1 creators who have like opinion based stuff. Um, I think the consensus a lot of people think of, which is in isn't correct is that everyone is kind of against each other like oh they've done a video therefore I can't do a video or they've copied my idea or whatever like that everyone is kind of working together because effectively it just raises everyone's sort of um profile in a sense I know that sounds a bit sort of ego a bit maniac but that's kind of what it is and with the F1 community I think because it's really like sort of blossomed in the last few years with like you know drive to survive coming out and new creators coming up it's grand and I think it's just more of like a collaborative effort where regardless of your profile size or whatever it is it's if you've got something decent to say then go for it and everyone can recognize it when someone's just being fake or if someone's actually got a true like passion for the sport and can back it up really um and it's the same with veloce you know like that's one thing i really do like about the company is that they do have such a big talent pool regardless if regardless of your size if you're like a small creator or a large one effectively if um if you're showing that you can hustle and you've got a really good work ethic and, and um, are really motivated by that, then of course, Veloce would want to help you out and support you in that way. Um, and that's why we try to feature just like so many different um, creators on, on on the shows we produce, say like Backseat Driver or Overtakes of the Week or whatever it could be. Um, because um, if the Veloce company can help raise your platform even more then it's kind of a win for everybody um and it's a lot different to how, how other like sort of older mcns used to work whereas with this one it's way more collaborative um like coming into our filming studios and whatnot um, but i think that's the main thing it's just everyone's just everyone just loves the sport really obviously you've got your different opinion of like who your favorite driver is or different opinion on like an incident but you still love the sport as what it is because you don't have any of the um complications that you do like say with like football with like different leagues or you know different um like super leagues coming in or, or anything like that it's just formula one is that you've got you've got your drivers you've got your teams and we're all just watching in on it as it were um so i think that's the main difference for it it's just like yeah everyone's seeing it more as a, a collaborative fun effort rather than it, everyone trying to like beat someone else uh, at like views or whatever <laughs> yeah and you spoke about how the formula one community has changed so massively in the last few years you were someone that was at Formula E when it was just starting off. And that's the series that's really evolved in you know, popularity, even just the speed of the cars and the locations they're able to get to. It's been really, really cool to watch that series evolve. How do you view where it is now compared to where it was at the start and the journey it's been on as a series? Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting one because like, luckily because I'm out of the sport now, I can be way more truthful <laughs> about it. Um, there's a lot of things they do right about it. There's a lot of it that they do wrong. Um, and there's like certain old practices in place which need to kind of be changed to like raise their profile a bit more. Um, I think I do always have a sweet spot for Formula E because it's like the first proper championship I, I worked in where the difference with like Formula One to like, like Formula E is that Formula E feels like a family. Everybody knows everyone. And you have this to an extent with Formula One, but not to Formula E's one because like when you're going out to a race is like nine times out of 10, most of the grid is on the plane that you're flying out to. Um, and everyone's kind of there because they just like racing. And I think with Formula E, it's more the case of like the things they're trying to add into the broadcast or into the fan engagement isn't really kind of working and I think people can see that for what it is so for example like fan boost like it's the clearest day clearest day excuse me a clearest day that um no one it, no one likes it. it it it's it feels very fake because it kind of feels like a popularity contest 
I understand why Formula E are trying to do it because it's a bit of engagement uh, through social media. However, now they've removed that element, it's a bit like, well, it's just a popularity contest to get extra extra power during the race and it feels false. So I think that's one thing which like the sport really needs to, needs to remove. And I think it's also how they're actually trying to promote the series. Um, because obviously up until now, there's been very much like green energy, you know, renewable energy. This is the way of the future, blah, blah, blah. But if you go down the route of like a climate change perspective, as good of it is as it is to like project your picture onto that, it's it's you always will have like a knife in your back a little bit because it's never going to be like a viral sort of entity. Whereas the way I've always wanted formerly to go down is always still be the, the electric route. But let's say we had like a street race in Tokyo. It's a night race and you can imagine it, you know, with the neon lights and everything and it make it look visually really cool looks like something of the future that for me looks sounds way more exciting than um here's some renewable energy sort of cars and stuff and it's a bit of a it's trying to make it a bit more sexy effects effectively and i, and I i'm glad now that they're we're going to go to this new sort of gen 3 car um not too sure about its looks but we've got to wait and see, and see until all 24 cars are on the grid like sort of going against each other but at least they're kind of trying but the main thing with formula e is that it's not trying to be formula one and it never has tried to be formula one the only uh, the only similarities it's got is that it's got formula in the name. Apart from that, there's no there's no sort of similarities there apart from it being a motorsport. Um, but there's a really interesting fact though that we learned um, that Formula E sort of do every year. They always do like these big reports into like the viewers and the analytics and stuff. And um, one of the key ones that always stuck out stuck out to me is that um, ninety percent of people who watch Formula E watch Formula one but only 10 percent of people who watch formula one watch formula e and as soon as you kind of realize that it's like okay you need to really harness who your audience is if it is if you are going to try and go down the younger demographic route you do need to then kind of lose some of the sustainability like massive messaging you've got and go down more of this route of it being really exciting and try to not over market yourself because um if, like, i think it got to like two seasons ago where Drive to Survive had just boomed. Uh, like it's a really new, interesting way. Um, also the same for McLaren Unboxed that kind of got released at the same time. Um, and you saw a massive popularity of that grow to the point where now most teams are doing their own McLaren Unboxed too, and are trying to do a Drive to Survive angle. But now every championship, they've seen the success from that and is now trying to replicate that. And with Formula E at one point, they were just over-marketing how much behind the scenes stuff they're doing, but they weren't focusing on the actual race itself they were just like showing all the behind the scenes perspective going to ott with it and it kind of just was alienating audiences and wasn't reminding itself of what a cool championship it was like we were able to do two really cool viral videos with them um to try and boost uh, formula e's um sort of platform but then nothing's really happened kind of since then it was always like a like, like a, a uh, a, a highlight of our year that we get to do, try and do one big viral video, like really sp uh, spend a load of cash on, on a video just to make it cool, not caring really about the viewers, uh, a view count, sorry, um, just to make it like amplify its message a bit more. Um, so that's something which I, I think formally we should try and get back into a bit more because like, the, the, the viral videos we did for it were, were really cool. Um, so we had like Damon Walters, who like he was like a Hollywood stunt guy, backflip over the Formula E car. Oh um, yeah, yeah, I remember that. That and was then, cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, completely fake, but um, well, no, yeah. not, not not fully fake, but um, but he, it, it was, wasn't it wasn't aligned, was it? It was kind of in front, and then he car drove. Oh, well, well, yeah. So he he did the actual jump for real, um, but he and I can say this now because the NDA has has fully ran out. But he had wires basically attached either side of him, oh, okay. um, which was there for like an insurance perspective, because obviously we wouldn't be insured to to have him actually jump yeah. it. Um, so he did do the jump, but basically it was an assisted lift effectively. So okay. he did jump over. So when he jumped and he kind of lift hoisted over um, and then basically um, a VFX company sort of painted out the background so you can see that. Um, but I think like there was a German um, like Mythbusters um, uh, show who actually debunked it because there's one frame where the paintwork uh was covering like the rear wing or something and as soon as you said it, you'd be like ah that's how it done it um but still though like when it was released it uh, something like that hadn't really been done before because you only seen people doing it over supercars but that's what i kind of missed about um formula in that respect of doing something cool like we would always pitch uh fun viral ideas like the one i had um was that they do like a pit stop but whilst skydiving so basically their car gets rolled out of a, of, of a plane and the guy gets out of one car and then jumps into another car and then gets out of that before they all crash to the ground um 
But uh, but yeah, that's one thing I kind of miss with Formula E that is a, a fun aspect. But yeah, as, as, going back to what you were really saying, yeah, Formula E is more like a family, whereas F1 is obviously the more grown up adult, effectively. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned that teams are kind of embracing this idea of sharing the behind the scenes details a lot more because the fan appetite for that content is really growing. Do you feel that there's a risk, though, of, of almost chasing their own tail a, a tail a little because behind the scenes content by definition if, if you just release too much of it it just becomes the scenes almost like there's no there's nothing to go behind anymore when there's a camera in every meeting room you hear about now these kind of formula one meeting rooms even between the team principals where they should be closed you feel like because it's a genuine you know these are huge businesses that are running here but then you start bringing the cameras in and everyone starts playing then to that and it, it there's a risk of kind of losing the reality by trying to get the behind the scenes info of everything it, it's almost a bit of a paradox how do you, did you feel there's an answer to that balancing act and, and maybe formula one's going a little bit too far at the moment with that yeah so i think it's like where a lot of the teams i can understand it from the team's perspective why they're doing it because clearly an exec from let's say i'm going to pluck one out at random like williams and i'm not i'm not going on williams here i'm just as a random pluck one out i'm sure like an exec was looking at their marketing and were like oh mclaren and box that's doing really well in terms of views we need to do something similar to that. So let's re let's do something similar, but then change the name effectively. And there's so many of them now. There's like off the grid, behind the visor, and all these other all these other sort of um, uh, uh, content streams coming out. But then the risk you do have, like you said, yeah, is starting to get a bit oversaturated. Where you're just it's the same thing. You you see them getting to the track on a Friday. No one's talking to the camera. Um, someone's picked up a coffee and they've got some music playing in the garage. And then it cuts to qualifying and you know, obviously they can't show anything of the track of the car. So it's just the mechanics in there. And it's it's the same thing, really. And I do worry that it is starting to get a bit oversaturated. Um, and whereas you've got like the that's what kind of what the appeal of Drive to Survive is, is because, you know, there is a dedicated camera crew who are there just to get the spicy moments and such. And obviously the teams themselves won't ever show that they won't show, you know, like Daniel Orlando, like arguing or, you know, like a. Uh, 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 Ferrari, you know, with like Leclerc shouting at the team or anything like that. You know, in drives when they say, "Oh, drives to survive team are within that weekend," you're like, "Oh, you've got something to look forward to." Whereas for teams, it's a bit like, "Well, it's just as if we're there as a VIP, but without the, the proper benefits for it." So I do think they need to kind of res restrict a bit more on the behind the scenes stuff they're showing because I think that's part of the appeal that F1 fans have with like drives to survive um, that you can look forward to something coming at the end of the year. Um, but then I do also see it from the team's perspective that they do want to kind of show off a bit more what their team environment is like. Um, you know, like let's say like Haas, for example, before, you know, Mazepin left, everyone kind of saw them as like kind of like the villain team um, and not being like that great because the performance wasn't really sort of related to it. But then obviously since he's he's left and they're having a bit more, you know, behind the scenes access in their team um, uh, with their own YouTube uh, content, as it were, you feel a bit more of like, oh no, this is like a nicer team, proper sort of like British team and like a bit of banter here and there as it were. And you kind of have that more, um, it's trying to change the idea, um, your ideations uh, or your your, your your viewpoint on on them. So I think they need to find a bit of a balancing act. And I do think, I think Formula One needs to kind of like restrict them to how much they can shoot there. Um, because I think otherwise it's just like, I think if they were to say, you can't really shoot that much during qualifying in the race, that's cool. That means they need to focus more on like the free practice sessions and find the more team aspect of it. Because I've always, yeah, as you said, there isn't much behind the scenes to actually show, really. <laughs> yeah, and it also feels like it's something that the, the drivers always mention, um, and they they always talk about, you know, how how many more people are in the team than you see, and how much how many people back at the factory are working every single day of the week to design the cars, test them, put them together, test them again, test them again, test you know everything that goes into building them, but then. The videos where we're seeing, you know, the, the on-track action, it's just kind of the drivers walking around. But it, you yeah. feel like the, the the drama, the actual behind-the-scenes drama now, is still the stuff happening at, at the factories. And Mercedes, I would I would say maybe the best have embraced that aspect where they do these like debrief videos where they say kind of oh, really yeah. actually detailed technical information about what was going on in the cars. Do you think that's kind of the right path for a team to take then to really show? true behind the scenes info not just drivers walking around oh yeah absolutely i think because the reason they're showing the drivers walking around is because they know like 
if you have Lando and Daniel walking around for a bit, they, they know they're going to get a certain amount of view counts coming into it. And it's the same with all teams, you know, uh, even with like Nicholas Satifi and like Albon, there'll still be fans who just want to watch them, um, just seeing how they're getting on. But then for an actual fan who, like a proper like, um, um, uh, like connected fan to the sport, they would have a deeper understanding of it. And I think it's what Mercedes is doing is great. Uh, you know, the technical analysis of what they can sort of talk about, because they don't want to give them much, they don't want to give too much away. I think then doing a proper, proper deep dive into like, here's, uh, I think the great example of that was with um, Bottas in Monaco, where his wheel nut wouldn't come off. They did a proper like deep dive into like, this is exactly what the issue was. Um, and a proper understanding to so the viewer who left that thinking, oh, wow, what's that going on? Having a proper like explainer is so good. And also having someone, um, let's say they have like a really bad, um, like Mercedes, I think they had a, an issue, obviously went back with, um, I think it's Sakia with Russell. They did a video explaining what went on and the thought process. Because obviously we can look at a, a race and be like, oh, they're throwing away the strategy. What are they thinking? But then actually having like the technical advisor being like, here is exactly what we were thinking with the data that we had. It's like, oh, okay, it's kind of a bit more understandable. And I think what you touched on there of saying like, whatever thing happens back in the factory, that for me as a viewer, I would love to, to see that stuff because obviously um they have like the simulator guys you know working like almost like um, overnight trying to get the best setup whilst they're sleeping at, at the track like that's the insight i would love to see i would love to see like you know mercedes or another team you know doing a deep dive into okay this is what happens after like free practice um two and then go back to the factory and be like right let's refine this bit here okay what about doing some aero changes and then constantly doing laps on the simulator and refine that that's stuff i would love to see because also it's something we haven't seen before and it's, it's having that little like extra little golden nugget of of something that's new which we haven't seen and then that's what i think teams need to kind of be focusing more but um yeah i mean that's a i think that's a great shot i might actually try and nick that video to actually <laughs> to do that myself <laughs> go, go ahead if, if, if i can get in the description i'm i'm happy but, um, <laughs> i think I also wanted to touch on, we spoke earlier about your videos about the graphics and, and also the role that graphics play as, as part of the presentation. How do you approach, you know, Formula One's such a complicated sport. We just spoke about uh, factory, all these brilliant minds that go into putting these cars together and, and designing them. How do you approach the task of filtering that down for an audience that's watching the race for the first time and refining a sport that is so complicated to make it still approachable to first time viewers? Yeah, I think that's the thing we always need to remember that there's they, they need to always uh, like they always need to um, be viewable for someone who's never seen the sport before. Like they need to be have it so that someone who's never watched can watch the full race and has fully understood what's going on, rather than being a bit confusing or you know trying to establish who is what driver. But obviously, us hardcore F1 fans can look at stuff like AWS or even when they got the onboards on it has like the live tracker name above the uh, car in front we can look at that and we can joke about it being like oh it looks a bit like f1 game or like well that that rating they've given makes no sense to us it's a little bit like what we have with drive to survive like hardcore fans won't really like drive to survive, drive to survive because we know a lot of it is fabricated um but they always need to apply to a new viewer base and to try and bring new viewers into it so when you have something as ridiculous as say like a AWS, um, you know, like pit lane predictor or like overtaking predictor, whatever it is, um, we can look at that and be like, oh, we don't really want to know because like we kind of want to work it out for ourselves. But at the same time, they do need to apply it to someone who's never watched it before so they can understand, be like, oh, I can now understand why there is tension coming on. Um, and so I think it is a bit of a balancing act. I would say this season they have like massively reduced the amount of AWS graphics they're, they're showing. And some of the stuff they are showing is basically, you know, like corner speeds and then also like the, yeah, the overtaking uh, um, sort of like um, predictor where it's just using actual stats rather than using like algorithms or anything to like determine a driver's rating. Um, but then when obviously we can always mock like the previous stuff they always have of like, you know, a driver's rating or like um, the car's like uh, performance compared to everyone else. And we can look at that being like, well, that's all up for speculation because no matter what, you know, analytics you put into it it's it's all up for spe speculation it's sort of comparing michael schumacher to like lewis hamilton of, of who's the greatest of all time there's arguments from both sides but there will never be a right or wrong answer because it's 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 uh, apples and oranges it's it's two different things and when you're comparing stuff like power rankings or or drivability or focus or experience it's a bit like well it's all up for interpretation really because 
whatever argument you could put into it, it can't be a definitive, this is the answer. Um, so I think like the broadcast has actually done a really good job in terms of like constantly updating what they're what they're um, they're providing, listening to fan feedback of what they what they like and what they don't like. Um, in, even in terms of like you know onboard angles, that's why we're starting to see less of like the uh, of the front wing angle um, and or the offset T is more like making it more easily viewable for everybody, um, just so then we can get the best experience seeing the seeing the sport we love. Yeah, and it really seems like. It has to be viewed as as a success story with Formula One. You know how it is growing. The evidence suggests that people viewing it for the first time will return. Then they you know start to engage on social media. They'll follow a team. They'll you know pick up on the Twitter inside jokes, and then they'll follow a fan who's in the replies. And the kind of pathway for a fan to go transfer from being a new fan who is kind of reading these graphics, and then you kind of almost go on this journey where you start to learn everything. And Formula One's one of those things where a deep dive into the history books can be so rewarding you learn about you know even stories back you know races like you you covered in your videos races from the 70s what formula one was like back then and, and how everything that's gone into it has, has kind of evolved um one last thing i wanted to touch on about kind of your process as a creator would be who who would you consider your inspirations even maybe in fictional filmmaking or you know cinema behind the camera are there directors that particularly inspire you at the moment um I think well, my one one of my favourite directors is um, Edgar Wright, and uh, um, oh god, I completely forgot his name now. And he directed uh, Twenty Eight Days Later, and oh, I completely forgot his name now. Is a oh dear me, this is really bad. Uh, I've got to well, one second. I've got to Google this, otherwise I'm going to be so so in the mud here. Oh, what's his name? Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle, that's the one. Apologies, Danny. Um, yeah, those two are my uh, like my favorite directors, um, just because of their it's like their unique style of of trying to change up how sort of film film has been done. Um, so those are like sort of my my two like for like Edgar, for example, is how to like transition from scene to scene to scene, and then uh, with Danny Boyle, it's more the creative uh, visuals you're seeing with him with like these really obscure camera angles and such. Um, so those are the two ones I would really sort of. Get go into but I don't think I reflect them much in my in my process on, on YouTube I think the guys who I watch on YouTube I try it's going to sound really weird but like the guys who I watch on YouTube isn't motorsport folk effectively um and I think I, that's why I do quite like that this is like my little sort of area even my partner doesn't watch um doesn't watch um Formula One um but the guys I, I tend to watch is a bit like Colin Furs or uh, Tom Scott or uh, the uh, Corridor Crew guys um, who I've been watching for, for, for years and years, uh, just because I like the way they are storytelling. Um, and although it's not like a, a narrative as such as like a film or, or a TV show, um, they're still holding a narrative through what you're wanting to watch. Um, and a great, yeah, great example of that is with like Colin Furs, where he'll be trying to build some form of invention or like an underground bunker or whatever he's working on. But the secret source he has there is what can keep you from watching from start to finish. And like, and when you look at his videos, it's not like overly produced. There isn't like a massive camera crew there, or if it's uh, it's, it's him like sometimes just holding a GoPro and just like being excited and really, really like sort of enthusiastic about what he's making. And that's what gets you excited to watch those videos. And that's what I would love to like sort of, that's what I try to always aim for with my stuff um, where I'm, I'm still learning, you know, to be less camera shy uh, of like trying to still be my myself when the camera is on which is a hard thing to learn just to being yourself in front of like a like a lens like this for example um but then that's one thing i'm trying to learn to be to be a bit more authentic so when i'm like when i was at bahrain for example visiting the bell racing factory um i was just outside of it being like this is so cool look how cool this is i've traveled so many miles to be here um and then it's just trying to like sort of find the right balance with that um but yeah those those are the guys who are sort of the most sort of in, inspiring and inspiring for me um hence also why i'm wearing um i always wear the same shirt um <laughs> it's uh funny enough it's, it's something i've just picked up on um that you know like colin furs or, or tom scott or tom scar or whomever it might be um but they always have like filming shirts and it's not too it's it's, it's more just so then like when you're watching my content you know you recognize me a bit easier if that makes sense not so that you can just pick me out from a crowd i, I don't wear this out anywhere I, this is just for filming purposes um but also massively helps out for continu continuity. Um, so then um, if I'm ever needing to re-record something 
or um, if I'm going out, um, or if I'm having to just redo something, it's always the same. Oh, it's that guy who always wears the same shirt. But also, it just started from this this being my favorite shirt. I loved wearing it. Um, I just started wearing it in a few videos, and then someone clocked on. I was like, oh, you, why do you always wear that one? I was like, oh, I just like wearing it, and it's kind of now stuck. And now I think someone. Um, the one thing I always get is I always I always get told I'm like the Tom Scott of moat sport which i'm not holding i'm not putting that in my bio or anything like that but they said that one of because one of the parallels is that you always wear the same shirt and once i realized that, i was like well i kind of don't really want to stop wearing this shirt and i've now realized it's kind of stuck so that's that's the reason i always wear this so <laughs> absolutely I, I thought as soon as you mentioned tom scott i thought i've got my segue into the next question but you, you, you did it all for me um i wanted to actually so one there was a, a video i think it was it within the last year that um tom scott had made where he was someone who was not a motorsport fan and he did this lap around the uh, Nordschleife with a professional driver. And I think yeah. in that video, he really captured the kind of magic that a, a new motorsport fan can have. And, and him, him as a creator, he's been on YouTube for such a long time and, and really kind of exemplifies that strategy of just delving right into niches, really doing the research, you know, the accuracy, the consistency, and of course the uh, similarity of dress code. Um, <laughs> one last thing I one last thing I did want to touch on just before we wrap up. We've just had the British Grand Prix last weekend. And in many people's minds, you know, it was one of the best Grand Prix people have maybe ever seen and, and definitely one of the best so far this season. We really got to see the new 2022 regulations in action. Those new cars better at overtaking, better at staying close. You're not overheating the front tires as much. And the evidence was on display. For me personally, you know, I was at the track. I was at Stowe. Really lucky because we saw... Um, Perez overtaken, the Hamilton overtaken, the big, you know, oh, roar amazing. of the crowd as as they went through there. It was it was awesome. And and just the, the whole drama of the event. Um, what were the headlines for you as a as a spectator for that race and, and how do you think it's changed the, the Formula One season with its impact? Yeah, well, obviously the biggest talking point from that is obviously Joe's crash. Uh, um and you know, like how it's just more about the drama about it. And I think we're it's not like, you know, the uh Roman Grosjean incident where, you know, obviously that was such a big dramatical uh, dramatic crash, but we we're all a bit hesitant to talk about it because, you know, he was very injured and we just want to be a bit more respectful. And with this this take case here with Joe. It's a bit weird because we can all be way more, you know, open about it, you know, sharing photos and stuff because we know he got out of it absolutely fine. I mean, apart from like a, a bit like bit, being a bit shaken up and stuff and it, and the images look worse than, than himself because he got gone out, out, out absolutely fine. Um, and I think like obviously there's been some talk about, you know, if the safety is, is really there. But I also think it's such a benign, like such a like once in a lifetime kind of crash that like, all the safety elements that were in place fully worked. You know, like the roll hoop, for example, got grinded down, but it's it still did protect him. And it, that's what that's what it was there for. Likewise, with the roll um, with the um, with the uh, the halo, the gravel s started to slow him down, and then um, you know the tires and the, and the catch fence, everything kind of worked. And the only thing that was a bit sketchy was the fact that the fence um, was um, it, he got obviously caught between the fence and the tire wall. But then you've got the thing of where, well, that in itself is a safety standpoint because the fence needs to be allowed to flex. Otherwise, what could happen is that the actual fence could bend backwards and then that could then go into the crowd because obviously the um, they have uh, a massive like dugouts in concrete. So the metal uh, metal uh, sort of fence can go all the way down. That's how it's more secure. But then they can't put the tire wall or they can't like, you know, weld it together because then if he was to still go down through that slot, and let's say, God forbid, it was to catch fire, you wouldn't be able to get him out of there because you can't move that tire wall. And that's 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 the reason you need to have that extra room there. So all the safety features were in place. And like motorsport is dangerous. And I'm, that's not me saying that's the answer. I'd be like, oh, it's all fine. But like, it's one of the worst things that we've seen. Um, and obviously, I think at Silverstone as well, like we saw a couple of cases where the Halo device has saved lives. We saw it in the, you know, in the F2 race as well, where if that Halo device wasn't there, God forbid, what would have that actually happened to the to the driver in that in the crash where he went over the sausage curve? But this is where we can look at things and redef um, redefine the more safety elements for it. For example, we don't need sausage curves anymore. They, they they're not they're not needed. They are just literally going to be ramps now, so we just don't need them anymore. But aside from the, you know Joe. Um, I think the main thing as well, it's like uh, the the weird strategy and the weird sort of like um, environment Ferrari have currently got at the moment where like 
you got this weird inter-team battle with Leclerc and Sainz, where like all of us can kind of look at it objectively and be like, well, no, Leclerc kind of should be given the, the priority because he's performing better when the team work together. Um, and Sainz's sort of victory, or as much as good as it was, like, well, as it's so early in the season, team orders can't play a, a play a factor into it. However, for some reason, Leclerc, he was told he was just following team orders and was told to stay out and basically that lost him, lost him the race. Uh, um, but then also the tire strategy when we had it back in Monaco, where uh, Carlos Sainz just, just ignored the team orders, but then just because that was the better alternative, he then performed better. So it's kind of like it's kind of down to Ferrari now to really look into their strategy team and be like, right, what's going wrong here? Because we all objectively can see it as fans. We can see the Ferrari strategy. It's just not been working. It's not due to the drivers or anything. It's just to whatever decisions they're making, it's not working for the team. And Leclerc, he's Ferrari through and through. So he'll follow whatever the team say. And science has been more of this sort of like rebellious type. Well, not rebellious. I don't want to say that as a, like, that's his whole demeanor. But like, just because that one scenario in Monaco, he took a gamble and was like, I'm going to ignore the team order as come in for the pits and then benefited from that um and it was clear in this race as well you know like science was holding up leclerc uh, for a good few laps all of us were like just let him through and you do the constant thing of like if he can't go faster at the end of the race what position so it's fair um and we're not so far in that we can have any team orders but then even you know the the, the demeanor of like you know benoso coming over to leclerc in park Ferme and kind of like you know with his finger waggling and like sort of telling him off and stuff it's a bit like that for me like it just didn't really set set it didn't settle right with me because you know we've seen it with like lewis hamilton um with uh total wolf where you know total wolf has admitted you know yeah the car is not working and you know it's, it's, as i said yeah this is a like a, a poo box basically on, on the, over, over the radio um uh to hamilton and be like sorry about this yeah you know it, well, it's not good what's have you it's fine when with this scenario it was so clear that the ferrari strategy was wrong um and then Bonotto comes over and he's kind of like don't say that stuff over the team radio it's a bit like mate own up to it a little bit like yeah of course it's not it's not going to be like enthusiastic for your team to hear but also it's not like a golden achievement wall for just participating like you this is the one time you could potentially win a championship if you're messing it up then it's on you and Leclerc's doing everything right um so I think it's just a bit weird. Obviously, they, it's, it's more because like he's trying to protect their heritage and their image because you know Ferrari fans through through are like so like determined and so backing behind the team. But in that instance, it's just a bit like Ferrari are needing to sort things out. But uh, I think those were the main big ones there. And obviously, you know Hamilton coming going through that amazing pass when the two of them were, like saw squabbling positions. Um, originally, I wasn't a fan of Verstappen, you know, pushing off Schumacher, but also like. I kind of had to be like, you know what, it's a bit more of just hard racing. If we're saying hard racing, then that's kind of what it is. Um, because then if we we're all be like, oh, we want more more battles, but then getting pushed off, it's like, well, you can't have both. And you know what, I'm a bit more of a fan of like, well, if he gets away with it, then you know what, Mick, you can do that to him in the next in the next corner. You can push him off a little bit, like, and it's keeping it fair as long as you're not crashing into each other. But you know what, that's what we saw, you know, with Leclerc and Perez, and um, then Hamilton going through. That was such a great battle. But then if that was ever heavily policed, being like, okay, no, Perez, you're going to get a five or ten second penalty. Uh, Leclerc, you went off. Uh, you you had like um, you gained an advantage. Like that's no, just let them let them race a bit more. It's, it's all fine. Uh, um, but yeah, I think as you said, best race of the season so far. Absolutely, and it, it seems I think it was said over the commentary, and, and it was also something that um, I believe Esteban Ocon had said at the uh, Saudi Arabia race. But that driving these new cars, it feels a little bit more like watching a go-kart race and that you, you feel yeah. like the, the cars have run so close together that even that little move where Hamilton was able to sweep through um, like at Loughfield, I guess, right, and, and get that double overtake done. It was just so satisfying to see that move get pulled off and the fact that it actually was possible. So good. Um, with karting being that foundation, do you feel like, you know, that it's a positive thing that we see Formula One getting a bit more like those kind of karting races? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's like, that's what we've been wanting to see. Like the cars have been like, I don't want to say it's been too powerful because that's the whole point of is evolving the speed and evolving it. But the main thing we just wanted was closer racing. Um, and I think the main headline this season uh, for that has been the tyres. You know, like we're not seeing many like well, obviously we saw it in Silverstone but before then everyone was struggling with the soft tires and the, the, basically the the mediums and the hard were like the new better compounds always like always working from that um but I think because they're having an issue with the kind of the new new uh sort of tire formats 
and because of how the new aero is working, it means cars are able to follow in battle a lot closer. Um, I think it's down at the at uh, turns. Uh, I want to say seven and eight, just outside the BRDC. You know, the, the swooping right hander before you go onto the old start finish straight. We saw so many ma moves going around the, around the outside there as well because they were just able to follow a lot easier. Um, obviously, they're not going at breakneck speed, but also like there's less dirty air coming from it. Um, so I think the new 2022 cars are working. That's what was intended. It, it feels weird now looking back on like the pre previous iteration of the car because now that looks so dated. We're also now new, like we're also used to like oh, the curvy way it looks. And I remember how when it first came out um, when Fra uh, when uh, Formula One released it with like that, that weird chrome, awful looking livery. We were a bit like, okay, this is not gonna. This, this it can't really settle it with it well. But it's the same with the halo. You know, if we, like seeing a car now without the halo kind of looks a bit weird. Um, but I, I think yeah, the cars are showing that it's working really well, and it's it's just it's, it's just providing better racing, which is what we all want to see. We don't want to snooze fest or anything. We just want to see proper hard racing all the time, and then a bit of drama thrown in. And we've got a really kind of different track next weekend with the uh, Austrian Grand Prix. Going there, you know, a, a huge part of Silverstone was the fan engagement, people being so passionate for uh, all our British drivers that we have in Formula One. Now we're going over to the Red Bull ring. And I would say definitely from the stands, there was some hostility towards Verstappen. You know, he goes in, he pits, everyone goes, oh, hey, come on, let's go. Verstappen's down <laughs> at eight. So it was, it was interesting to see that. Um, but, you know, the, the Verstappen fans are going to be out in full force at the Red Bull ring. Um, and he's still leading the championship by over 25 points. So he's, he's kind of got that insurance almost. But do you think it's going to be a return to form for Verstappen when we uh, head to Austria this weekend? I think so. And I think it's like, we, yeah, we've got to remember like his, like his downfall at Silverstone wasn't his fault. It was, um, it was, yeah, it was literally t taken up some, from damage um, uh, from, yeah, from, from the sister team. Um, otherwise, yeah, he was, he's going to be doing really good. I'm so glad though, that we've actually got a proper respectful title fight between Leclerc and Verstappen. And I think Silverstone needed to kind of happen for the championship for it to be remaining good. Because obviously there's a time at the beginning of the season where Ferrari just, going away with it basically and, you know for, originally you know the rebels were having issues with their fuel um and like parts of it going wrong not really the energy not really the engine reliability issues but it's more with ferrari um but now we're actually seeing a proper close fight um not through just just through the happening of how racing is going not through like uh, random penalties or anything like that and the racing they're doing is being respectful so i'm really hoping that we're going to have a really close fight at austria um, obviously it's Red Bull ring, so everyone always thinks Red Bull's going to do good there. Hasn't always been the case, um, but I think Ferrari is going to be strong there. I think Verstappen and Leclerc will sail away. And I think the main, um, and it's literally going to be like the battle of like the second drivers now as well, like between Perez and, and Sainz, who I consider to be second drivers there. Because um, I think there's going to be a, a big hefty, a hof, like hefty gap. And then um, they're just going to be like just covering off the uh, the midfield. But I'm really looking forward to it though. Um, I want to know, though, who, who do you think is going to, if you had to give your prediction, who do you think is going to win at Austria? That's a good question. I, I would say, well, I, I'm trying to think, you know, we got our evidence of, of what a Verstappen-Leclerc battle at Austria looked like in 2019, right? When, you know, there was this, yeah. everyone was all up in arms about it, but I think it was another example of, of hard racing that Verstappen showed with, with Mick. He got that overtake at um, what they call turn three, but it's actually the second corner at Austria, but, you know. Yeah. Um, that I, I feel like if, if it comes down, if, if all the cars work perfectly and, and um, everything goes to plan technically, I don't think you can take it away from Verstappen because I feel like it, it's so important. We know like last season, um, I think a huge test for him was the Dutch Grand Prix going there. Yeah. That huge swing of fans in, in the intense championship battle we had last year, him to take on all that pressure and, you know, pole victory and, and all the celebration that went with it. I feel like there's going to be a similar atmosphere this weekend um, in Austria. And, and yeah, I don't think you can look far past Verstappen for that victory. Um, and, and it's also, you know, it's things like uh, the the double stack at, at Silverstone was something that Ferrari could have done, right? At, at the safety car. Yeah. It did seem like the gap was kind of there to do that. And you can almost feel like if Ferrari had the Red Bull pit crew and were as kind of refined and consistent and, and fast as the Red Bull pit crew, they would then have the confidence to do strategy plays like that double stack. And it feels like mm. Red Bull kind of all, already have that set up and they could, they kind of run with that confidence. So yeah, I feel like uh, 
if the Alpha Tauri's can stay away from each other and, and there's nothing nothing goes on with, <laughs> with extra damage and, and unluckiness, then yeah. Uh, then yeah, I would think maybe Verstappen would be taking the top step. But I also think you know beyond the the front of the field, so much of Formula One is is these midfield battles and the points that go down through kind of fifth to tenth are so critical for these smaller teams, and um, that's going to be really where we see you know a, a lot of the fighting as well and and. It's something that maybe even even in the years prior, it's been a bit boring at the front, but the midfield's always been so intense because those points are oh, so yeah. valuable. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, if if we get the you know continuity of, of that great overtaking, then that midfield is, is gonna be where it's at. And I, I'm still crossing my fingers for a return to form for Daniel Ricardo. I feel like it, it's oh tough mate, to... mate, don't, don't even start. This is I'm okay. my heart breaks. He's, he's my favorite, he's my favorite driver, and I'm just it's so horrible to see. And every week I will I've got a full book of excuses as to why he's not been performing, you know, like even like last weekend, um, as soon as Ted Kravitz said like, oh, there's a bit of an issue with his DRS straight away. That's my, that's my excuse. He couldn't pass anyone. He didn't have any DRS. Uh, and during qualifying, it started raining when he went on his, on his second push. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully with you there. It's, it's, it breaks my heart. Like he's, he's my favorite driver. And I have openly said, if he gets a podium this season, I will tattoo his number three somewhere on my body. Um, and then I feel like though that's been the biggest jinx <laughs> I've ever done to my favorite guy. Um, but yeah, I really hope he returns to form soon. It seems like um, I remember before, you know, when Carlos and uh, Daniel were talking once, Carlos said to him like, "Oh yeah, the car is really funny to drive, isn't it? It's all to do with like the braking and, and what have you." Because um, obviously Daniel's more of like a straight line brake and then quick out the corner, whereas it's more it has to be more of a progressive braking around the corner, which I think he struggles with. Um, but mate, yeah, it's breaking my heart though. It's um, it's it's so sad to sort of see, and I really hope it does sort itself out soon. But at the same time, I don't know what, I don't know why it is that needs to like change in his mindset to like get it to work. Apparently, because uh, it's, it's just like I don't know if it's like a mental thing or if it's more of like a um, like a confidence or, or if it's more of just the actual technique that he, he's still trying to finesse. Um, but yeah, it's always so sad to see when he's like got this such positive attitude, and then it doesn't reflect on his results. It's it's yeah, it's it's really upsetting. But um, like he said though, he's still got a contract for next season, and um, like I'm having to take that as is. Um, obviously, people still speculate, but he he and the team have both said he's got a contract for next season. So I'm most hopeful. I'm just so so hopeful that like the car can be more trained into it. I do think though, what's happening at the moment is obviously Lando is like the number one there, and he's basically. There's been time, but I mean, we saw it in Monaco where Daniel was testing uh, setup changes, potentially could, what could work and what couldn't work. And in Monaco, they just got a bit too greedy and lowered the car a bit too much. So that's how he then bottomed out and then crashed. So that literally wasn't Daniel's fault. It just, he saw the car bottoming out. But those people thought, oh, it's him. It's like, nope, that was a, literally a team setup choice. So I reckon they are testing stuff out with Daniel to then give it to them to then their star driver. Um, which breaks my heart to say that Daniel is not the star driver. But um, yeah, like you said, I, I hope he comes back soon. <laughs> yeah, and the, the conversations around kind of drivers, places in the teams and in the market, it, I mean, it, it, you know, it always happens as a transfer market like any other international sport, but it can feel a bit more like football now where you start to so quickly after bad performances. It's a bit like how you know people talk about football managers. If you're the manager of Man United for the last six years, you can't go two weeks without someone suggesting you should be fired but um yeah I, I wanted to ask you know beyond formula one who do you think could be maybe the top driver in the international kind of open wheel driver market who isn't in formula one a lot of people look to indycar colton herta pato award figures like that where they you know the young drivers kind of at the top of their game but then you also mm -hmm. have the world endurance championship and we see those transfers between categories do happen quite a lot but then you you kind of align that you also have the, the ladder of, of Formula One and, and Formula Two. Maybe mm. I, I'm not sure. I, I can keep talking if you, if you need some time to think. No, no. I, th I think I think Pato would be my probably my my choice. I think with that. I mean, like his yeah. Like I I I, I watched the whole of the um of the five five hundred um not Le Mans um Indianapolis five hundred um. And just seeing him, like you know, just coming through, it was awesome to, to watch. Um, I do. I'm also a big fan of Felix Rosenquist as well because he showed dominance, you know, when he was in Formula E, and then went across to IndyCar, and he's done done really, really, really well there. Um, and also, yeah, you got some notable guys, and obviously in Formula E as well. You know, you got Sam Bird, um, who I would always root for, and uh, Mitch Evans, um, and also Nick Cassidy, who did amazingly well um, starting out in Formula E, but also did super well in Super Formula um, over in um, over in Asia. Um, 
Yeah, I'd probably say though my, my top pick would probably be Pato, just because like yeah, the the amount of like like changeability he can have from different machinery has been really really good. I don't know if he's done uh, world endurance yet, um, but uh, and, and another guy as well, Sebastian uh, Sebastian Bremi, um, you know, uh, awesome Le Mans driver and like with Toyota and also again with Formula E and also in Formula One he was he was doing quite well there. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hard one, but I think I would have to go Pato. I think if if you had to put my put guns to my head. Amazing. Well, I, I've got through everything I've gotten written down on my list here. So I think this has been a really brilliant interview. I, you know, learning about what happens behind the scenes, what goes into to making a good YouTube video. And I think, you know, if you're a creator or, or just a fan, there's been a lot to, to learn from, from what you said today, Matt. So I'll say a really, really big thank you from me for coming on. That's all good. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, no, it's been really good to like to chat all things motorsport. I mean, me chatting with anyone with motorsport is good. And then also to talk about sort of anything all and all YouTube and um, whatnot. I always, I always love it because, yeah, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be like a secret to like how like sort of uh, like how videos are made or anything like that. I will say, though, for anyone who is wanting to like properly start out sort of doing YouTube, I will say, though, like find something you love, but then stick to that one sort of niche and don't go too open ended with it. Because that's the issue I had with my channel. Like I wanted to cover Formula E, go-karting, Formula One and sim racing. And although the most sport was the niche, it was still too open-ended. Um, and so I would say if you are trying to start out with something, just, yeah, do try to focus in on one particular area and just really nail it. Um, find what your passion is. Just enjoy making the videos is the main thing. That's that's why I love love making my videos is because it's, it's an actual joy to, like, find out and learn about these sort of things. So, um, yeah, anytime I can just waffle on about myself i, I love it <laughs> that's a joke <laughs> absolutely well a, a great message there and uh, i would say a, a massive thank you for me uh, for, for listening to the episode and, and i'll be back next week with more interviews and we're looking forward to a really brilliant austrian grand prix so yeah thanks for listening and uh, i'll be back next week